Hey everyone, it's Naomi Sneakus and welcome to the firecracker department. Okay, all right, it's late. It's I've just arrived in Halifax uh, where we are shooting season seven for Mr. D. And um, I promised, I promised I would get this intro done before tomorrow. So, you know, a promise is a promise and here we are. My dog is rolling around on the bed a little bit of a snuff, and uh, we're gonna get her done. Here's what I've been thinking about this week, um, because we have been shooting uh, Mr. D for seven years, and a lot of the crew is the same. And so I wanna give some shout outs to our crew, because you know what? We're nothing without our crew, and the crews in Halifax are amazing, amazing. They're kind, they're thoughtful, they work hard, they've got a great sense of humor, which is so imperative with, um, hold on a second, Rufus, hey, lie down, lie down, good boy, oh, and then he gets back up, he runs me, and then he shakes, uh, but the crew is incredible, I just, okay, so from everybody, from Michael and Heather and Debbie and Chrissy who do uh, transport, you know, that's important because we get up in the morning and I don't know which way I'm going. I don't even drink coffee anymore and I still don't know where I'm going. And I open the door, they get me and Rufus into the car and they take me where I need to go. And they do it with like a positive energy so it starts your day off right. So important. Can you imagine getting into the car and having somebody grumpy? Oh, Jimmy! See, Jimmy also is fantastic over in transport too, but we have not um, had that many uh, rides together. Uh, but I love them. I love each and every one of them. And then you sit down in the uh, makeup chair where Amanda and hair from Lori and that whole team gets you going in a positive way too, which, gosh, what would we do without them? It's really killer. And then I'm also gonna give the shout out. So like the folks behind the camera, like the, um, like the DOPs, oh my God, Ian Bibby and, uh, and um, oh my God, now I'm gapping on all their names, of course, Johnny and um, Forbes and Dean and Eddie. They're all awesome because all they wanna do is make good work and make this great comedy show and everybody pulls together and it's amazing. And then you've got Jordan and Andrew in craft services that if you go, oh, I, can you get me does this weird little thing that I need to eat today? And they are like, yeah, we can do that. I don't do that a lot. I'm not one of those people that say, can you get me that weird little thing? I don't do that. But I do know that when I by accident ate the last chicken um, salad that's so good. Uh, oh my gosh, they make the best chicken salads. I ate the last one. They made another one because that's the kind of people they are. It's just the greatest crew in the world. I'm trying to think anybody else, but I mean, you know, we've got the, the writing team as well. Jesse Gabe, who I interviewed on um, the firecracker department early on, who's just a dynamo, you know, like she's there every minute looking at every scene, seeing how to make it funnier, seeing what to do. I mean, Jerry's there too, but you never can tell if he's acting, directing, writing, because he's wearing all the hats at the same time and looking good doing it. Uh, so yeah, it's amazing. We've got an amazing, amazing team of folks um, and we're lucky. And how can you forget all the amazing people that work so hard in the Mr. D offices like um, Shauna Hatt, who's the production manager and the uh, Georgina and the Volpe and oh my gosh, all the writers. I'm forgetting people. Sarah McLeod, who makes sure that we get on and off planes. And when I am sitting in an airport for the fourth hour because my flight is delayed, she's still texting me going, hang in there, honey, it's gonna be okay. And just that kind of support, it's amazing. Or Jimmy, who makes sure there is not one little piece of lint <laughs> on my costume every single take. And uh, Martha and Jesse, Jesse, who looks after my dog. That's like, she's in the costume, she doesn't have to do this, but she lets Rufus hang out in the wardrobe truck every day. It's that, right? It's this family, and gosh. We've got um, Kat and Bruce, who uh, are second ADs and are incredible people. And Nicole, who is on set as a fantastic PA. Oh my gosh, I could just go on. Go on and on and on. Mary Louise, and on continuity. Oh my gosh. That I can remember all these names is something of a miracle. Um, but truthfully, 
it's an amazing group of people and we are so lucky to be in this industry where you get to meet folks like this and and work with them like this it's it's extraordinary you know it it happens like you know you get the shout outs um writers directors actors those guys get shout outs but the folks like like the camera crew and the the craft folks and the transport and the makeup and hair they don't they don't get those as much and uh, they should because they make this happen i'll tell you what if you're in a good mood and you're laughing already before they start rolling the camera it's a great show if you are grumpy <laughs> i did a show once and this woman did my hair and she would like wrestle with it because she was frustrated with putting it up in this into this bun and she would wrestle it so every day i would just start the day with this wrestling woman on my head <laughs> there's an image run with it speaking of running mm, speaking of image no speaking of head here's my next guest who has a head and now i've got cameron manheim that i didn't know here's the thing i didn't know I was missing something from my life until I met Cameron Manheim. That sounds very grand, but I think when you hear this interview, you'll realize she's just an effing inspiration. You know, she came to Toronto. She was like, I got to get involved. I got to go see theater. She met a couple of people and then she just immersed herself into the community. Like she knew Toronto more than I did. And uh, I'm just enamored with her and I'm inspired by her. And I'm so grateful I, I, we get to be friends now. And it's the best. Uh, yeah, she brought over a great cheese tray. It wasn't even a tray. It was like a whole kitchen island. Oh, my God. It was the best thing ever. Now, whenever I see a cheese tray, I'm like, meh, Cameron Manhams was better. Um, you know what's going to happen during this interview is you're going to hear clickety click click. And you're going to hear some whining. I want you to know it's not me. It was my dog. And I make excuses for my dog sometimes, but this one, you know, you just, you gotta take the dog with you sometimes because that's the way life ha is. And she didn't care, so I didn't care. And uh, eventually he sat settled down and on her lap and I think we probably fed him cheese. Cause who doesn't like cheese, you guys? Nobody. That's your answer, I'm sure, nobody. All right, here she is, the one and only, my friend, Karen Mannheim. You're, like, I really do feel like you showed Toronto to me in a different light while you've been here. I definitely feel like I know more about Toronto than most people who live here. It's true, though. <laughs> you ate it up. Had you been here before? I had been here. If you would have asked me prior to coming what I thought about Toronto versus Vancouver, you know, I would have said Vancouver is the most beautiful city in the world, but I've never been able to find its heartbeat. Yeah. And Toronto, not the most beautiful city in the world, but just filled with so much happy, house. you know, fun people. Yeah. Um, but that was, I haven't been here for 12 or 13 years. Yeah. And I probably was, I stayed at the Sutton Place. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Great. And so that was my point of reference of Toronto. It didn't seem, there weren't these incredible buildings by the waterfront. It just was in that little no. area. So coming here and staying, you know, down near Queen Street West and King Street West and what's happening on Portland and yeah. all the incredible restaurants, yeah. it's like, I want to live in this town. Yeah. Well, you soaked it up. You also saw theater like nobody else. Yeah. Theater, but you came at the Fringe, too, which was pretty perfect. True. But yeah. I still would have... I mean, prior to... I was here prior to the I know. Fringe. You saw, like... And I was, you know, going to see things at Soul Pepper, and I saw Stranger Babies at the Sandbox, and I saw some of the bigger things uh, that tourists go to see, but I was always looking for the Fringe yeah. theater before the Fringe even started. Yeah. And then when it started, I just kind of closed my eyes and pointed at a couple pieces and went and I was delighted. You've yeah. got amazing talent here. I know and then people go to New York, which is obviously a great place for theater, but mm -hmm. then they don't even realize the theater that's going on in our city. It's true because I've asked a bunch of people who I've met, you know, what fringe show should I go see? Yeah. What company should I follow? Yeah. They're like, gosh, I've never been to the fringe. And yeah. it just goes to show you when you live in a city 
you know, I never went to the Empire State Building when I lived in New York. Right. Um, I never, you know, you may have never even been to the CN Tower, but I used I went. to go all the time. Oh, yeah. Because we had uh, staff passes, so we'd be like, let's just go up for a coffee. I know. Just for the heck it, of it. It's an amazing view to see how big Toronto yeah. is and how sprawling it is, yeah. you know? But the Fringe was the biggest and most wonderful surprise for me of this town. What's been the most inspiring thing that you've seen while you've been here? I know that's a big so question. Much. I know, so, but so I don't much. think you have a. You're you don't. You're very positive, and you see everything. Even if it's a bad show, you'll go yes. But this is what I gained from it, which well, is a great way to see theater. Well, that's true. I don't like to waste my time. So if I'm at a show that may not be, you know, perfectly directed or perfectly acted or yeah. perfectly written, I instead of just being angry and spending my time being pissed off. Which sometimes I do get sure. when, like, really shitty theater hits yeah. the stage. I'm like, why did you use all these resources to put this crap on stage? Yeah. I will get angry now and then. But I will often go see a show and I'll just rewrite it or redirect it or react it <laughs> I while it's is. happening. Yeah. And then that's the way I can spend my time without getting really frustrated. But yeah. that really hasn't happened here. Um, there was something wonderful to be gained on in all the shows I saw but if I had to you know I didn't I saw five and there were um several that I would totally recommend I saw T-Rex's yeah bendy sign I feel like that was like Ah, one of the best ones for you it's you know I mean it's hard to explain it if I'm not give doing justice to it when I say it it has a similar feel to Avenue Q Mm -hmm. if you've ever seen that but it is smart. It's, I mean, Avenue Q is amazing. It, it was smart and clever, and the people in it were charming and delicious. Yeah. And then I saw, is it But Kapinski? Is that what it yeah, is? You, yeah, you've mentioned this before, but I don't know. Fantastic. Hashtag. Yeah. Fan, it's either, it's either But Kaplinski or But Kapinski. I right. can't remember. And I think your listeners will forgive me for that. Yeah, I think they'll But um, she is a clown. And she was phenomenal. Yeah. But I would say my very favorite thing I saw here the entire time I was here was Blind Date. Oh, yeah, with Rebecca. With Rebecca Northen. She is... It was... It was divine. Yeah. It was divine. It is. It's because it's not just a piece of theater. Like, there's more to it than that. It is... It's a sociological, you know, exploration when you... And it, and it doesn't exist before she starts that night. Mm-hmm. It's a improvised piece with um, a very brave person from the audience yeah. who helps her create the piece. But they don't really know that. They're just going along for the ride. And she guides them, of course. But every piece will be different. And so when you begin, the play doesn't exist because there's another human that you bring up on stage who's 50% of the cast. Yeah. And you're just so waiting choosing to see that where... Person. Yeah, choosing that person must take... It takes some kind of finesse and savvy. You know, I know she kind of... So basically, you know, uh, as the audience is coming in, she's looking at different men that she can ambush and bring up on stage. She's mingling. She's stalking. And she's she's asking people how they would feel if uh, she were to call on them. She goes, no, I'm putting you on the maybe list because she doesn't want to get people too excited and then feel bad all evening they weren't called. So she's. I think she's really clever about that. I'm just going to put you on the maybe list, but if I were to call you, how would you feel? So it's not a a, a complete 100% surprise. Yeah. What happens in the play is a 100% surprise, but not the fact she's called on them. And then uh, she (laughs) proceeds to... I mean, I don't know. I don't want to give it all away, but well, goes I mean, on a blind date night, right? and so, then goes through, you know, a whole lifetime with them yeah, on stage. And it's it beautiful. Is, it's beautiful. And they've done it with same sex couples too. That's what I heard. That? I, I heard. I love that. But the guy that she picked in the beginning, I was mad at him. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, oh my god, I'm so irritated with this guy because he was trying to be. He was yeah. very shy and very earnest at heart. Um, incredibly shy, like was I've got kids I've got a wife yeah. I can't do this and she had to take him over to the side and say listen right this so there's thing a little pocket yeah. over here where she's allowed to just take go she out of- tapes out a little square yeah. on the side of the stage and she brings the act you know the human over there and yeah, says human. this is what we're doing <laughs> Over in this square, it's you and me. You can ask me any questions. We call this square the timeout square. Yeah. 
And um, if you have any problems during our play, you just call a timeout. We'll come over here and you can tell me how you're feeling. Your wife can call a timeout. Yeah. I can call a timeout. But this is where reality is in this square. Right. When we go back on stage and we're in the play, you don't have children. You aren't married. You're my date. Yes. And uh, he agreed to that. It was, you know, it's complicated. It's super complicated. She asked a question and either they have to make it all up or exclude their children and their wife from every, you know, scenario. Yeah. Um, And then she takes you on this journey. And in the beginning, he was like talking over her, trying to be clever. And I'm like, oh, this is miserable. Just be real. And then, you know, she disarmed him at some point. And uh, he was real. And he was his earnest, real, sweet self. And it was beautiful, yeah. actually. And she, by, has a, she has a very special gift with that kind of stuff. Well, I totally fell in love with her. And I didn't know her. And I waited for her afterwards. <laughs> and I said, um, afterwards, I'm like, I would love to take you to lunch. That was remarkable. I just think I'm an actor. She's like, I know who you are. And I'm like, can I, can we go out? She's like, sure. And I was like, no, 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 listen to me. This isn't like, can we go out? Maybe call me or I'll call you. I am desperate for friends in Toronto. I am begging you to take mercy on me and take me to lunch (laughs) so that I could have some adult friends because I'm here in Toronto with my son for three months and all of his, you know, people who were 18, 16 to 18 years old. And listen, if I never talk to a 16 year old, the rest of my life, I'll yeah. be fine. Yeah. So. <laughs> yeah. But now where does, where does your love for theater come from? Cause you were born in P- Peoria. Yeah. Like that's I, not a hugely theatrical town. No, but I would stand in front of a mirror and do voices and characters. It was just. Who taught you that though? Who gave you that passion? Like, was there, like, an impetus of a show that you saw or a person that you met? Well, I suspect that happened. I don't really recall it. My parents um, are teachers and educators, and we, my mother is from New York, so right. ev- we were in the Midwest. Right. But every now and then we'd get to New York to visit her mother, my grandmother, and I think she would take me to a play. I recall some early plays, yeah. but I don't remember the moment, like... I have to do this. No. I just, it always was. Since like, the moment I was born, I was theatrical and loud and telling stories mm-hmm. and in trouble mm-hmm. and getting suspended. <laughs> it just yeah. was dramatic. True from the day I was born. Only child? No, baby. Baby. I'm the baby. So was that like, ba 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 look it's at like, me. Yeah, hello. Yeah. I know you've already had two kids and you're over it, yeah. but I'm here. <laughs> You know, uh, my sister was, you know, the perfect child. She was five years older, and my brother was 14 years older. Wow. So I was definitely an oops baby. Or like a miracle. Uh, Yeah. (laughs) Not that, that's for sure. (laughs) It was one of, I, it was, it was meant to be. It was Bechert. Like, I always knew it. There was never, there was never anything else I wanted to be. Yeah. Um, And television and film didn't seem like an option for me. Right. Just... And why? From, like from the beginning, you were like, I just want to do theater. Yeah, I just want to do theater. And so, I want to play different cards. I want to cry on stage. I want to move people. I want to tell stories. I want to make them laugh. And uh, so, you know, I, I was in a third grade play. You know, I did plays ever since I re- recall. Yeah. Um, and it just, there was never. My father, who's very practical, said, You really need a plan B. Right. You have to have a plan. Because he day. was a mathematician. He was a mathematician. That's the way it is. You, the, yeah. the numbers just are not going to add up unless yeah. you can have a backup. And get... My parents were fantastic. I don't think ever in a million years they thought I would make a living from doing theater and being in entertainment. Right. But they, because they're cultured and artistic people, you know, artsy people, museums and art and theater and music, I... It was a beautiful thing that they didn't persuade me not to yeah. go down that There was that never path. a moment that they were like... The only thing was, you really have to have a education and another plan to make money, because this is probably not going to happen. Right. But they didn't say that, <laughs> right. but they did, and they're like, you need another thing you can do. Right. And so... Which you did. I did. Yeah. I had... I was... I You know, from... <laughs> you know, for being somebody who's not particularly religious, I, there, it's, there, 
the universe has looked after me in so many ways yeah. and presented many, many things in front of me that have been gifts. But, um, you know, of course, I, I got a great education. Both my parents were professors. I was going to, there was no question I right. was going to college. <laughs> right. um, but I, uh, what, what was that thing I was going to do when I was trying to be an actor? Was I going to be a waiter? Was I going to be a teacher? What was I going to do? Yeah. And uh, it just fell into my lap, really, because I never, it was never a dream, and I never pursued it actively that I ended up um, learning sign language and becoming a sign language interpreter. That's incredible, because I feel like that fed so much of your career. It absolutely Like, did. from the beginning, of it, when you used it in the practice to just doing Spring Awakenings, like, you're... You're a very unique person. To but me. that's what I mean. It's like my life is very magical in that way. You know, I I knew a, I knew 10 signs. Uh, I didn't, you know, everybody learned the alphabet because that's how we communicated, you know, quietly in class together. Yeah. But I learned a little bit of sign language. And um, one day I was just finishing up college at the University of Santa Cruz. And I was all packed up and I had a couple days before I moved to New York. Right. And because um, that was always tra- to the trajectory, w- yes. Well, I was lucky enough to get into NYU. You know, there was a huge audition process. There were there were eleven. S- okay, let me back it up. Yeah, yeah, back up. There's a uh, couple of many steps here. That I'm back curious it up. About. Um, I went to UC Santa Cruz because I lived in California and it was cheaper to go to a sure. California school. And my grades were very good, right. except for my language credits. And in order. If you're a California resident and you want to go to a University of California school, there are wonderful universities, but there's a requirement that you have two languages to get in. And I just don't have that gene. No. I don't know about you, no, but I, I... My brother does. I took French twice, I took Spanish twice, and I failed them both. Yeah. So you can imagine being the daughter of two Jewish educators <laughs> and... Um, the college saying, well, your grades are beautiful and we'd love to accept you, but you're denied until you finish getting two language oh credits. God. Yeah. Literally, it was like, I, you know, my parents were so upset. It felt like I was never going to be able to be buried in a Jewish cemetery. Right. <laughs> it like, it's extreme. just like so, such a big deal when you're a daughter of Jewish educators yeah. that you can't get into college. Yeah. So I had to go to a community college, which was a shame on my family. <laughs> you know, I say that jokingly because they're super cool, but um, it felt shameful, um, even though community colleges are awesome. And I went there and I was lucky enough to be there at the one time in history at that time that they were uh, providing sign language as a language. Right. Prior to that moment, it had always been a humanities or else I would have taken it for my languages. But they always said, oh, no, it's a humanity credit, which wouldn't have gotten me into college. So I took two classes really quick. Uh, I dropped them immediately and I went off to college and I was just graduating from the Calif- UC, um, UC Santa Cruz, uh-huh. which is where I went to college. And um, I was walking down the street, and I saw a man get hit by a car. And it, it was traumatic, obviously. Mm-hmm. And I ran to a local, you know, nearby house. This is prior to cell phones and computers, because um, I'm as ancient <laughs> as the hills. Right. And right. Um, I knocked on the door, and we called the ambulance, and they came, and the police came, and they surrounded this man, and his eyes were open. He was laying on the ground, and they said to him, Sir, could you tell us your name? We'd like to contact your family. And he was looking at them, but he wasn't saying anything, and they said it again, Sir, please just give us your name and your number. We want to contact your family. And he kept looking at them, but wouldn't say anything. And then the one of the police officers yelled at him. He's like, Sir! Like, We've asked you three times. That's Tell gonna, us your name. It could and, be in shock. And, yeah, yeah, totally. It could be brain damage for all you know. And he's yelling at this guy. But something hit me from across the street. And I walked over to the policeman and I said, could he be deaf? And, you know, his eyes kind of wide. And he goes, can you ask him? And I, and I was like, um, uh, you know, there's... When you take two sign language classes and then haven't done it for five years, yeah. there's about ten things you remember. The word deaf, the sign for deaf, yeah. and the sign for, I'm sorry, could you sign that more slowly? Right. <laughs> That's yeah, like yeah. all you can remember. It's like every language. You have it's, to be able to say, I don't speak that language, yeah, or please slow, slow down. down. Yeah. And so I said, I could probably ask him if he's deaf. And I, don't, I wasn't even sure if that would work. 
But I kind of leaned over past the paramedics and past the police, and I just signed, are you deaf? And this man's eyes kind of lit up, and from with his broken arm rose his, you know, hand that shook, yes. Right. And we're like, oh my God, he's yeah. deaf. Oh my God, he's deaf. We're literally, we, we, it almost seemed like we were joyful yeah, because yeah. we figured something <laughs> out, but we were petrified. Yeah. It was a victory. And he's like, get his phone number. And I'm like, no, 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 no. I, numbers are pretty sophisticated in sign language. They're right. not what you might think. Right. They're really complex. I'm like, no, I don't think I can get his number. And they're like, you can get his number. I'm like, okay. <laughs> and I just remember asking what his phone number was and signing to him probably maybe over a dozen times. I'm sorry, could you sign that more slowly? Yeah. And you could see he was in pain. It was oh, terrible. God. I felt awful. Yeah. And I think I finally got his phone number and I, I repeated it back to him. And he was like, yes. And he was in pain. And then the police officer looked at me and he said, um, we're taking him to the hospital. Will you come with us? And I'm like, I, I got to tell you, I don't know sign language. This is the fluke extent done, of yeah. my, this is crazy. I got this information for you. And he looked at me and he said, well, you know more than we do. And, I, and then I had this pang of realization that, oh my God, I have never been asked so nicely to get in the back of a police right. car before. <laughs> because I was a little bit of a protester at school and uh-huh. got arrested a couple of times. I'm like, oh my God, I have like a friend in the police force right. now. I'm getting in. <laughs> so I went to the hospital to wait for this man's family. And, um, you know, about 45 minutes later, they came. So I did get the number, obviously, and his parents came, his wife, and his two children. Oh, my gosh. And every single one of them was deaf. No kidding. It was a hereditary gene, and they were all deaf. And he married a deaf woman, and wow. they had deaf children. And so the the doctors would come out from, you know, surgery going, tell them he has a tear in the lower oh left gosh. quadrant of his right ventricle. And I'm like, no. No. I can't I'll just write do it that. down. Well, you know, unfortunately, those are words probably a deaf family aren't going to understand. Well, any family. So yeah. I was literally writing, drawing hearts oh and sectioning them into four parts and then doing like the charade for sewing. Right. It was... <laughs> it helps that you're really good at games. It was, that's true. <laughs> it was um, terrifying. And also, I have never felt so, you know, inadequate in my life. Right. But I stayed for five or six hours with the family until he was safely out of surgery. And it was exhausting. Yeah. And I just, I felt like I was there to help and I wasn't very good at it. But I know I, I did the best I could. And I left that night and I just had this deep sense of dissatisfaction. And and I, I was like, God, I should just need to be better at things, right. at helping. <laughs> Just and in general. In general, better. I need to know more. Yeah. And um, three days later, I moved from Santa Cruz to New York City to yeah. go to graduate school, which, you know, is the whole other story how I even got into NYU. But I do want to know that story. Though. I um, was walking down the street. It was probably three days before, after I started NYU. And I, uh, for those of you who know New York, NYU is on 721 Broadway. It's Tisch School of the Arts, and it's um, right next to Waverly Place. And I was approaching Waverly Place and I looked up and the big sign on a building said New York Society for the Deaf and I walked in and I said I have Monday night off what class do you teach and they said beginning and I'm like I'm in and I spent three years um, going to the New York Society for the Deaf becoming fluent and being fluent in sign language is different than being an interpreter yeah Um, because speaking for yourself is one thing but interpreting somebody else's words is a whole nother thing oh my gosh yeah and just about that time this big law in America passed called the American with Disabilities Act. And one of the um, rules along with this act was if you're deaf and you go into a, an establishment that employs 15 or more people. So, for example, Sears or McDonald's or, you know, Macy's and you go and you call them in advance and give them a, a certain amount of warning. I don't know if it's 48 hours or 36 hours and say, I'm coming in to buy a washing machine at Sears. And I'm going to need an interpreter there. They now had to, by law, give you an interpreter. Right. And I can guarantee you deaf people were calling 
everybody saying they wanted interpreters yeah. just because they had been oppressed for so long and interpreters unavailable for them for so long. They were sometimes needing them and other times just doing it to be like, okay, you didn't supply one, now I'm suing you. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so all yeah. of a sudden, the interpreter lines were ringing off the hook, like, we need interpreters. And my, my sign language school said, we will fast track you through a program if you will be an interpreter for us. And I was like, okay. Usually the program was like eight months. Yeah. And they were like, we're going to do it in three. Because oh. it was so, it was, everybody was desperate for yeah. interpreters. So they threw me into an imper- program and I came out and I was an interpreter. But the beauty, I mean, just the magic of the whole story is that after interpreting, you know, and I interpreted for deaf people at NYU or deaf people in therapy sessions or deaf people in courtrooms. But because I rode a motorcycle, because I, I've just had a motorcycle since I was like 16, yeah. I rode a motorcycle in New York. I got a very coveted job as an interpreter. I got the beeper. I got the the, yeah. the emergency hospital beeper. So at night, my beeper would be on. And if there was an emergency at the hospital, because I could get there so quickly on my mm-hmm. motorcycle... I got this incredible job. Oh, wow. And um, so I worked for St. Vincent's, for Beekman, for Bellevue, blah, blah, blah. And I had a little beeper. I felt so important. I'd get a phone call. I mean, it didn't happen all the time. I'd get a phone call like, pregnant woman, having a baby, deaf, come. <laughs> and I would get on my motorcycle. I'd arrive at emergency. So excited. I'd off my helmet. I'm like, I'm here. <laughs> and I would be the one who would get to sign, congratulations, you've got a baby boy. Mm-hmm. It's insane. And so it was a beautiful, a beautiful gift from the universe that all of that happened. All of those beautiful bits of the story happened. And, and that was my plan B yeah. while I was being, trying to be an actor. And then it's fed you so much, too. Oh, my God. Well, it took a long time before it. I, well, I went to Juilliard. I did a program at Juilliard where I learned how to interpret for the theater. So oh. they had a special program. And how's that different? It's really you different. Sort of translate a little bit, right? They're it's really different some... because you're not the actor. Right. You're the translator. Yeah. So you're on the side of the stage, and while you're trying to give an accurate representation of how the actor is performing, they really should be looking past you right. to the actor. And so you're trying to give a like, uh, you know, an, an equal example of what how their tone is. Yeah, emotionally, their journey too. Yeah, must be but you don't want to take the acting away else right. why even watch the right. actor right it's a complicated yeah. thing to be an interpreter for theater and there are people who do it really beautifully and some who miss the boat right um it was really hard but i remember i don't know if it was an agent but somebody once said to me if you're interpreting on the stage you're never going to be on the stage right so at some point i said i'm not going to do that anymore i really want to be on the stage myself yeah and not just an interpreter um so there's a ton of you know Ton of series of things, but you know, I went to NYU. It was. But did all those things, like when you were applying for NYU, did you have like the support of your family that constantly, like as a kid growing up, was that always your goal to be at NYU? NYU? Um, that's a good question. Um, I was at UC Santa Cruz in the middle of nowhere. Santa Cruz is a very small town in the middle of you know Central California. It's kind of where the redwoods and the ocean meat. It's yeah. beautiful and completely detached from anything that's happening in New York or Chicago or Los Angeles. Yeah. We didn't have computers. No yeah. one. So it's what I could get a hold of to read. I mean, I'd have to go to a library and read microfiche. You right. know what I mean? Right, right. And um, there was some chitter and chatter about where people, where actors should be. Right. It was LA or New York. And there was, uh, I knew I wanted to go to graduate school because in my family, just having a bachelor's degree was not enough. Right. You either had a master's or a PhD, and truthfully, having a master's, you were like the black child, the, <laughs> the you know, the black sheep. sheep. It's really crazy. Um, so I'm like, okay, I better get a master's degree. Um, and um, I thought, well, I really need to be in a big city if yeah. I want. So. There was this audition in San Francisco where 11 schools come and you can audition all right. in one day. And those 11 schools were like the top 11 theater schools, mm-hmm. you know. 
and I rode my motorcycle over Highway 17 yeah. to San Francisco, and I auditioned for 11 schools, individual auditions yeah. in one day. And you got like three minutes. You got to sing and do um, one piece. Do you remember your pieces? Yes. I did a Chris Durang piece. Um, about the psychologist one? The Peter Pan oh. piece. Um, oh, God, mm. we're terribly old. Um, but I, I Christopher Durang, though. Oh. Yeah. So funny. I know. What was your musical piece? I think I did something from working. I okay. think I did The Waitress from yeah. working. Yeah. And then I did this piece from uh, this Chris Durang. And, um, and then, you know, you find out like a month later what schools you got into. Yeah. And I got into... But that's a huge step from, um, am I saying your hometown, Peoria? Peoria. Yeah. 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 That's a huge chunk. Like to dream that big yeah. from a small town, that's, that takes balls, don't you think? I definitely think so. And I, but I, what I really think is like, I was a big girl growing up and I think no one had faith in me that I would really amount to much because it was just, it was just a hard, it was hard for them. You know, they, my parents even felt like if you're going to be a big girl, you know, your opportunities are going to be so little, no one's going to cast you. No, that's just not part of our culture. You got, you're not going to find yourself a boyfriend. Like I had a lot of opposition sure, from day one, yeah. you know, and I ended up becoming like, uh, I'll, sh I'll show you. Yeah. I became a fighter. I always had this image in my head that at my front door was a coat rack and on the coat rack was a pair of boxing gloves. It was imaginary, mm -hmm. but I felt like every day before I walked out my door, I was putting on boxing gloves to be like, who wants to mess with me? Who wants to tell me I can't go? Are you going to tell me I can't get in there? Because yeah. I will punch you in the face. And I was like that with teachers. I got suspended so many Did times. You? I was such a little rebel because I just felt everyone was saying no. Yeah. No, you can't. No, you're not. No, you'll never. And I'm yeah. like, I beg to differ and you are wrong, wrong, wrong. And it really shaped yeah. who I became, you know, and, um, you know, I teach now and I, I try to instill that same thing in my students. You got to fight. You got to, you know, there's this image. I, every time I was mad about something at, at college, at grad school, particularly, I would march up to the Dean's office and I'd go, I'm really upset about this and I'm going to tell you why. And I had no trouble telling people how I felt. I had no trouble with confrontation. Yeah. I believed I deserved this great education and I believed they were there to serve me. And if I had questions, they should answer them. And that is largely due to my parents. Yeah. That's who, a confidence that they gave you originally, obviously. They weren't the kind of parents who said you should respect them because you're older. Right. They're older. Don't respect your elders. She yeah. It would be like, you respect people who earn your respect. And those were all those little things. Yeah. Did they think I was going to make it as an actor? I don't think so. No? You know, did they think that I was going to have trouble because I was a big girl? Yes, they did. Did they want me to lose weight and how me about that? Yes, they did. But, you know, not for themselves, for me. Right. But little did they know as, as they were... My parents fought for the underdogs their whole life. They have been carrying picket signs and donating money and, you know, helping orphanages and... Uh, going to nuclear plants and protesting. They're amazing people. But one thing they failed to see was that I was an underdog. Really? Yeah. They didn't see me as an underdog. And so... I think you can't see your kid as an underdog, though, right? Because you think that your kid can do anything, don't you? Yeah, I think that they just... They didn't see how many forces were working against me. Right. You know what I mean? And I, I could have completely collapsed under all those forces mm -hmm. and uh, become very insecure and really um, self-deprecating. But for some reason, I did the opposite. Yeah. And I was like, no, 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 no. You, uh, you guys are all wrong about this, and I am going to show you. Yeah. And that's exactly what happened. Was there a turning point when you're like, I'm not going to choose the self-deprecation route? I'm going to stand up for myself. Um, <clears throat> gosh, you know, I wish there was like one moment in time. I know, sometimes there's those pillar of moments that you're like, there was that one time when that teacher talked yeah. down to me and I was like, no, not going to put up with that. Well, I wrote a book called Wake Up, I'm Fat yeah. about what it was like growing up fat in America. And believe me, it's no picnic. Mm -hmm. And I have a 
gazillion stories where people uh, came at me with a lot of negative, um, you know, I- ideas and tried to squelch my dream. Mm-hmm. And um, I talk about when I bought into it and also when I finally started to put my foot down. And so when you bought into it, were you like, okay, I got to start dieting. I got to yeah. change this. I got to change that, which I think is like, it's so anti our business where we're trying to fight for who we are and being authentic. And as soon as we know those two things, we're going to shine. Yeah. And by the way, art is supposed to imitate life and there are fat people in the world. Shouldn't we be bringing them to life so that people can see themselves relate and, you know, uh, get, get nourished by those stories of those people. Yeah. So, um, I would say that the big turning point for me, is we had a woman who ran my program who was a very fancy woman and <laughs> she had run she was an artistic director the first female artistic director of a major theater okay. and they brought her to run our program and she wanted me to conform right she had asked me many times she was very concerned about my weight and one of the not so good things about my time at NYU is that they invited uh, 29 students to come in, but they knew prior to that that not all 29 students would graduate. That one of the promises of NYU was that in our third year, we would all be directed by um, serious working directors in serious, fully produced shows. Right. And they knew that they that 29 people, that would be very hard to do. So they would bring in 29 people and from those 29, they would cultivate the company they wanted to bring to the final year of school. And, you know, it was my first day of NYU. We were all sitting in a big auditorium with, you know, the head of the the program. And she said, not all of you will graduate. And I'm like, what? Mm -hmm. What the fuck? Mm -hmm. Not all of us are going to graduate. I'm getting a master's degree. I am, there's nothing you can do to stop me. Yeah. I have to, if I want to be buried in a Jewish cemetery. <laughs> <laughs> that moment, that first day, that thing came to all, we're like, what is she talking about? Yeah. When you go to graduate school, you, you graduate because, I mean, unless you choose not to write your dissertation, you're graduating. Right. So I was blown away by that statement. And from that moment on, I was angry that, I'm going to be the one. I'm always the one in trouble. Right. I've been suspended. I've been kicked out. I'm too, I'm going to, I'm not going to be one Sidebar, of those. Sidebar, what so were you suspended for? Oh my God, I was suspended for many a thing, but mostly, you know, for rebellious activity. Okay. Like, I wore a flag to school one year. What do you mean you wore a flag to it school? Was red, like, as a dress? It was red, white, and blue day. Oh, okay. And, you know, I wore a flag to school. I, my family and I called the police and asked them if we could, if I could wear a flag. And they said, as long as you don't puncture it or sit on it, right. you can wrap it around you and wear it. And so I wore it to school for red, white, and blue day. And my, the principal of the school was like, you're not allowed to wear that. And I go, well, I am allowed to wear it. The police department said I could. See my boxing gloves? I am. I got my boxing gloves on. And he's like, well, I, uh, and you must take it off. I'm like, I'm not going to take it off. We called the police department. He goes, this is the the unified school district. Yeah. And um, I refused to take it off. And he suspended me. What? Yes. And then this just goes to show you how awesome my parents are. You're fine. Rufus is here with us. Yeah. You don't like my story? Everybody knows that you're here, Rufus. Everybody knows. Lie down. (laughs) <laughs> and I got suspended and on the back of my suspension slip it had little boxes you could check as to why you were suspended mm-hmm. and the box they checked said um, for repeated defiance repeated yeah and so my um, my father argued in front of the school board to have my suspension admonished because he said she only wore that flag to school once this yeah. is inaccurate and it was, yeah, yeah, yeah. But I already missed the day. Right. But, you know, that was one time I jumped out of a school window once. I told a teacher to go fuck themselves once. Why did I got, you jump out of a window? They wouldn't let me out of the class. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. You know, and because my parents were so awesome. Yeah. And I wouldn't get into, like, whipped or trouble yeah. for that. 
They'd be like, yeah, if you needed to use the restroom and they wouldn't let you out, jumping out the window sounds like the smart thing to do. <laughs> like, they were great that way. Yeah. So I was always in trouble. So, like, that first day, yeah. I knew it was me. I'm the one going. Right. Like, I, I, to this day, to this day, my name is Cameron, as you know. I'll be on a set, and they will call, Camera! And I'm like, I think I'm in trouble. And they're just calling for the cameraman, and I'm like, what did I do? They're like, no, camera. And I'm like, okay, well, it sounded a lot like my name. <laughs> like, I'm always feeling like I've done something wrong from my earlier That's life. That's so weird. You're like one of the most generous and giving people. I can't imagine. I just got in a little bit of trouble because sure. I had boxing gloves on my whole life. Well, yeah, I mean, you, if you're going to have boxing gloves on in the world, you're going to want to use them, right? So I know. Well, that th- goes up. I feel like if you force me to put them on, you know, you're going to get whacked. Right. Um, but that, when I was at NYU, and you were talking about, like, really important moments. Yeah. So the way it worked at NYU is um, we all went through a year, all 29 of us, and then we went through a half of year two, and then we got letters saying whether or not we were going to be invited back in right. the middle of our second year, in the winter of our discontent. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Nice. Um, and so, and we all know those letters were coming, and we we received them at school. Yeah. It was Nightmare. horrific. And I remember getting my letter. I still have it, and I printed it in my book. And, you know, um, I had to clear it through so many legal uh, places because, you know, and why you didn't like it. But my letter basically said, you're not a good citizen. Um, Your body is your instrument, and you show a lack of commitment to your body, therefore lack of commitment to your instrument, therefore lack of commitment to your art. Wow. And, you know, know, in, in, I don't really remember all the words, but basically the feeling was, we would like to see a lot less of you in the fall. Meaning they were asking me to lose weight. Lose weight before you come back. Yeah. And I didn't know. That just blows my mind. Sad, right? Isn't it? Like, how dare anybody speak to you like that? Also, like, it's not like you're not healthy. It's still going on, though. You know, everyone. You've broken boundaries with, like, so many of the roles that you've done, though. Like, giving other women and going, oh, she's on the practice. She's a strong, feisty, ballsy woman. Oh, that's possible in the world. Didn't you play, like, Snow White? I heard you played Played Snow White. Like, how? That's... Fucking awesome, right? That was always the plan when I started to figure out what my strength was going to be. Right. You know? And so anyway, uh, when you asked me when I bought into it, Mm -hmm. I bought into it at that moment. And I... Getting that letter. I didn't know what to do. I couldn't get kicked out of NYU. I I just couldn't. So I, um, I resorted to drugs and I took speed and I lost about 70 pounds oh my God. in about five months. Your poor body. And instead of anyone saying, oh, my God, are you okay? It was in the, like the height of the AIDS epidemic. Yeah. Are you all right? Yeah. Everyone's like, congratulations, Cameron. And I really, oh I, I felt all that. I felt like, oh, my God, I betrayed my body. I betrayed the reason why I'm on this planet. I know that I have a reason to open people's eyes. And, and I'm a fighter. And... I, um, I, you know, ended up in a hospital. Like, I might not be here. Oh, it's, my God. I might not. I could have made, a, you know, drastic mistake and done too much. And, you know, and I brought myself to a hospital one night because I thought I was dying of a heart attack. Right. And, it, and then um, that was, you know, everyone talks about hitting bottom. And I hit bottom in that moment. And I was angry. Yeah. And I was motivated, and I was ready to take it on. Right. And it was in that, in that moment that I was like, "You, um, no one can stop me from what I'm here to do, what I know I can accomplish." And it was from that moment on, I just became another person. I wasn't there to make trouble; I was there to make changes. You know, that's great. And um, is that when you start writing your one person show? I started writing my one person show because when I got out of NYU, um, I was one of the only people in my class who didn't get an agent. It was me too. Really I was the last sad. one to get one. It's sad. Oh, right? it hurts your heart. And the way that they did it or tell you what's happening is pretty, pretty devastating. We, my class, along with all those 11 other schools, because we were a union, those 11 schools that mm-hmm. all auditioned together yeah, early yeah. on. We um, 
all went to Juilliard and did like three days of auditions. Like one school was in the morning, another school was in the afternoon. And all these agents and right. managers and casting people came. And then they invited us into a room and, a, and lining all four of the walls were probably 300 sheets of paper and it would say what casting director, what agency, what manager. And then it would list your class and check your name if they wanted to meet you. So I walked into that room and I looked on all four walls under 300 sheets and there was no checks by my name. And I my understandably went into a very deep depression. No kidding. I didn't go to my college graduation and I never stepped foot back into NYU for several years. It was pretty How did you awful. get out of that? That would have been really devastating. There were a few people that really saved me. My last play at NYU. You know the you know the this year This is so sucky sometimes, it right? Was, it was really Ugh. really hard and that's yeah. why I teach now to try to prevent that you from do. happening to any other kids. Um, you you teach it even without your knowledge, like just by your presence in, in the well, world. Thank you. But my last play at NYU, remember I told you earlier, earlier that NYU promised to do fully produced shows by major directors? Mm-hmm. That was the, the vow they made to us. Um, Ten people were cut, and there were only 19 of us left, and we were doing three different plays in our final year. And we, since we were in New York, we could invite agents and managers to our last shows, and it was very exciting. And we were doing a Carol Churchill play called Fen, and this oh, very Churchill. fancy director was directing it. And I was so excited because this director could actually cast me at theaters around the country, yeah. you know, arena stage and the Goodman and, you know, everywhere. So about four days before we started rehearsing, Oh, and yeah, and by the way, one thing that NYU does, still does, and which I take a huge issue with, is you don't audition for the plays. They cast, right. you know, whoever is right. And I always said, I, I understand that. You can cast whoever you want to, but we should be auditioning for them, or else you're dropping us off after three years of training with a master's degree, and we've never had any proper auditioning. Right. Um, They still don't do it, even though I complain about it all the time. Um, But anyway, I'm so excited to work with David Chambers, who works at Arena Stage, and he's going to see I'm, you know, I'm really good and feisty. I'm going to get work out of this. And about three days before the the cast list went up, David Chambers drops out. I was devastated. It's my last show at NYU. Yeah. And we're and they put up somebody's name I've never heard of before. And I go up to the dean's <laughs> office. I go, this is not fair. I've paid one hundred fifty thousand dollars to go to this school. And one of your promises to us is that we get directors who are in the business. Mm-hmm. Like, you know, Cameron, it's uh, you know extraordinary circumstances. We feel we found a good director. You're just gonna have to trust us on this. And I was furious. Yeah. And generally, the cast list would go up, but since this director didn't know who any of us were, had never seen us, did not have any time right. to study who we were, he hadn't cast it yet. So he comes into the room, and we're all sitting in a circle, and I'm not happy about it. I'm sitting directly to his left, and he goes, listen, I don't know who any of you are, so Cameron, is it? Will you take the first role? You know, Naomi, will you take the second role? And we all read it, and this play, Carol Churchill's Ben, has about, you know, 18 characters in it, but there's only six or seven people in. Mm-hmm. So the girl I was playing for the first read-through was the ingenue, and she was somebody who only had to play one part because her part was so big. Mm-hmm. So I was playing the ingenue, which was hilarious, because in my entire time at NYU, I never played anyone no. my own age. You and me both. You know, I yeah. played, you know, uh, Miss uh, Nurse... Uh, I played, uh, what is it, Peachum right. in, uh, you know, in uh, the um, Three Penny Opera. Mm-hmm. I played Queen Margaret and Richard III. Amazing. She's dead. You know, I played... Great uh, roles, but... I mean, yeah. they were all really, you know, 75 or older. Right. So here I am playing the ingenue, and I always thought that was hilarious, but I'll do it this first time for this asshole director I hate. Right. And then... Um, <laughs> a rough. Uh, yeah. You know, just always, just always in a rough. Yeah. And, um, and then everyone else just played the part. And we read it, and it was good because the play is good. And then he said, "We're going to take a break, and then you all come back and tell me who you want to play." 
And so yeah. the real ingenue in my class was like, I want to play the ingenue. Right. And I'm like, I want to play the grandmother. I, that's who I, I would like to play all the old people because that's what I do. Yeah. And so we read it like that. And then afterwards, he goes, okay, let's take a short break. Then come back. And then I'm going to try to cast this. He comes back in. And he goes, all right. I, you know, I don't believe in fate. I don't believe in any of that. But I like the way we read it the first time. So that's how I'm going to cast it. <gasps> and I remember going, um, excuse me. Uh, I played the ingenue in the first read through, yeah. and I'm like laughing, going, "This is absurd. Yeah. You obviously didn't remember." And he goes, "Yeah, I know. I, I'd like you to play her in our show." And I'm like, um, "Actually, I don't want to. I don't want to play her." And he goes, "Why not?" And this is in yeah. front of my, you know, yeah. nine people in my class. I go, "This is my last show at NYU. I don't want to embarrass myself. I really just want to play what I do well." And I don't want to have to, you know, because there were some scenes where she kind of takes off clothes and right. kisses a boy. I'd never kissed a boy on stage. And um, and he's like, listen, I'm I am sorry you feel that way. I'm going to change your mind. But this is how I'm casting it. And I marched right back up to the dean's office. Right. And I'm like, <laughs> I don't know who this goddamn director is. He's casting me in parts I shouldn't be playing. And like, I really, yeah. I was just always on fire. Yeah. And he's like, Cameron, you guys got to give us a break. We're doing the best we can here. <laughs> we lost a director and we got a new one. So yeah. just do the goddamn role. It's a lead role, for God's sake. Yeah, you know? what are you worried about? I you just didn't like it. I yeah. don't like anything about it. Anyway, I ended up playing that role and it was a turning point in my life. And that shitty director that I fought so hard against was Tony Kushner. <laughs> Who ended up winning a Pulitzer Prize and, you know, 100,000 Tonys wow. and working for Steven Spielberg. And he, we, lo- we fell in love with each other. And um, the minute I graduated from NYU, he hired me and I got my equity card in my very first play. No. And it was... What was the play? It was, um, it was uh, Stella by, uh, I don't want to say, yeah. not Kreutz, but uh, Goethe. Right. It was Stella by Goethe. Wow. And um, Gabrielle Carteris was in it. Remember her from uh, Beverly Hills? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. She was in it. And some other awesome know. people. And um, that was the beginning. And I didn't have an agent because I didn't get one that fateful afternoon. Yeah. But um, after working with him and he introduced me to Steven Spinella and Michael Mayer, who I went on to do seven or eight plays with who's now the toast of, you know, Broadway. Right. And um, it was really on their wings that I learned to fly. They took a risk with me. And after years of working with Tony Kushner and Michael Mayer and awesome people, Mark Brokaw, and incredible directors, and I still didn't have an agent, I'm like... Uh, Saved so much money on commission. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> and a business manager, which I didn't need, so I didn't have to have any of those. Lawyers, publicists. Who needs it? So much money I saved. Yeah. Um, you, know, z- you know, 10% of nothing is nothing. Right. True <laughs> yeah. So I, um, I decided no one is paying attention to me, and I got shit to say. So I wrote a one-woman show. Right. And that's when everything changed. You have like all these little tipping points though, like the, having somebody like a like a Tony Kushner cheerlead you. Yeah. That's going to feel that's going to outweigh looking at those pieces of paper and yeah. not seeing your name ticked. Well, you know, Tony wasn't the Tony you know. No, we but were it's still just somebody artists like, together. An artist. Yeah. And it was really I fell in love with him, yeah. Michael Greif, all of those incredible artists. Um, when I, you know, you always hear those stories of old actors talk about who was in their class at yeah, the yeah, actor's yeah. studio. When I look back at who was in my class, not my actual class, but my community, yeah. they're amazing people amazing. who guided me. Chris Durang helped me with my one woman, woman show. She, he um, gave me notes on it, and oh Tony did, and Michael Mayer did, and Mark Brokaw directed it. And it's just insane how... Michael Ritchie, and a lot, maybe people listening to this may not know who he is, but he ended up, he, the last stage manager, the last job he did as a stage manager was my one woman show, and he ended up running, you know, New York Stage and Film, and now he runs the Mark Taper Forum, and the Amundsen, and Dorothy Chandler Pavilion, yeah. it's like, we were just babies. Yeah, yeah. And that generation time, of babies yeah. just became these beautiful artists. Yeah. So. But I also think that you must have had a very clear voice early. Like, as artists, we discover our voice as yeah. we go, but it feels like you had something to say when you were 12. <laughs> yeah, you know? I, I like, definitely had something to say, but it was 
mostly just people trying to hold me down. Yeah. I didn't like it. Like, I mean, like, I'm still that way. I don't like rules. I mean, I like, you know, I think we should all stop at red lights. I like sure. those rules. Sure. But Unless I guess it's a gravel road and then come on, that's a yield. Exactly. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But even when I go back to the very first movie I ever did, which um, was a, uh, it was called Sudden Impact with a Clint Eastwood. Mm-hmm. And they came to Santa Cruz and they were looking for extras and I showed up and um, they, we were all in a room and I don't know, I was very aware. You know, I don't smoke, I don't drink, I don't do anything. I always want to know what's going on. Yeah. Because I know no one's looking out for me. So mm. I got to look out for myself. And I just was watching and walking around the whole day. And I could see they were setting up um, cameras over, you know, in this big courtroom. And then they were also setting up some cameras in a tiny little elevator. And so when they go, listen, we need, you know, uh, 30 people. I'm like, I don't want to be in that group. No. I don't want to be in the group in the courtroom. I want to be in the group in the elevator. Right. And I remember he's like, I want everybody over here to go. And I was in that. And I just bent down and tied my shoe. And all those people went and sat in a courtroom for three days doing nothing. And there were just a handful of us left. And he's like, all right, I need some people in the hallway. And just people walked out. And there was... Tied your other shoe. One little person left, and that was me. He goes, I need you in the elevator. And I walked in the elevator, and it was unreal. Clint Eastwood was there with one other person. And it's that famous line that he says to that guy, you're nothing but dog shit. You know what happens to dog shit? It gets stepped on. And they just panned to the one person in the elevator, me, going, holy shit. (laughs) And the paper wrote about it. They said all of our Santa Cruisers were a blur, except for that one Cameron Mannheim. And I just, and I, right then I knew, as long as I stay alert and I know what's Mm -hmm. happening, I can help guide this yeah and so for from that moment on i just was always informed always knew what was going on and tried to put myself in the center of the storm and i think that had as much to do with it yeah as any talent that i have it's because you know they don't call it show art no but you have (laughs) talent to back it up like if you had like they panned over to you in the elevator and you shit the bed on that moment you'd be like oh no my tongue out yeah right (laughs) yeah Yes. Yeah. So I, you had like you course. believed in yourself enough that you knew when the moment came to you that it would be. And I will say the one thing that saved me is even though I was rejected a thousand times over, I never believed it was because I couldn't act. Right. I never believed that's why they rejected me. So maybe being a big girl, like it served you. It in saved so many ways. me, but it also was always my excuse. Like <laughs> you know, maybe I, I, maybe at some point I should have said, well, maybe I really should just go back and take a class. You know? <laughs> <laughs> but also, you call yourself like a misfit. But yeah. like a lot of people are like, oh, it's okay to be weird. But you were in your body. You were the misfit, which is it worked for you. It yeah. served you. You wrote a killer one woman show that uh, that ended up getting you the practice. Yeah, that was the probably the most defining moment in my life yeah was um one of the people in at nyu was marcia gay harden you know that actress yes i do she's remarkable yeah and you know she got some success right out of the gate and i think it was really hard for the the student you know her friends right you know it's really weird when you become successful there's this thing that happens where your friends will like i know you're too busy to talk to me so if you have some time let me know and people kind of move away from you yeah everyone always says that the the celebrated actor is the one who distances themselves but i think often it's the friends they're like no oh, they're so big now right. they don't want to be my friend yeah and a lot of that happened to marcia have you noticed uh, that with yourself uh i noticed it a little bit but i was much older when right. i and i was aware of it and right. i was particularly aware of it because of marcia because she told me about it and she's like yeah like my classmates don't even you know call or ask me what's how it's going it's really lonely mm. uh, being successful because there's it's competitive and it's it, you know there there's envy involved yeah. and they just weren't as graceful as they could have been i mean we've all felt envy for oh, different of course peoples. but you know the thing about envy and i i'm learning about that right now uh, through a very interesting prism because my son is now starting to act yeah and, uh, when you're 16 and you're acting and your friends are envious they don't have the grace to yes. cover it up. Yeah. And you can feel like, why are my friends mad at me? 
And, you know, the conversation is, they're not mad at you. They want something you have, and they don't know how to just own it fully to themselves. I am envious, too, of people, but I'm smarter and wiser now that I know that belongs to me, Mm -hmm. not to them. Mm -hmm. So um, I remember going to Marsha, I'm like, I'm like, well, well, you know, tell me, I want to know everything. Will you show me a script? I didn't know. When I saw my first movie script, Marsha showed it to me. I'm like, what's EXT? What's INT? What's this? Like, I didn't know exterior. I'd never seen a script. No kidding. Never. There's no computers back then because I'm ancient. Right. (laughs) And so I didn't know anyone who wrote a movie. I'd never seen a movie script. Right. You know, I didn't read a book on movies. I was I was studying so hard at NYU. And I was like, I need to see everything. Tell me all about it. And, um, you know, and we became super close friends. And when I wrote my one-woman show, she said to me, who's coming to your opening night? Mm-hmm. And I'm like, I don't know. My mom, my, my dad. My friends. Yeah. She said, no, you have to have fancy people at your opening night. You have to make it a thing. Yeah. I'm like, I don't have fancy people. I just got my, my friends. Yeah. She's like, okay, I'm going to try to get some fancy people there. And that was really very kind of her. And she brought her manager. And her manager brought a casting director who was in New York for two nights only. He came from L.A. And he came to run run the New York City Marathon. And later I heard that he said, not to Marsha, but to Marsha's manager, when the manager said, will you come with me to this one-woman show? He's like, I would rather stick a fork in my head. (laughs) Then go to a one-woman right. show the night before I run a marathon. And she's yeah. like, you have to come with me, please. It's only an hour and ten minutes. He's like, yeah. he so begrudgingly came. Yeah. And he was very good friends with Jodie Foster. So Marsha single-handedly brought some fancy people. What a friend. Which really makes a difference oh because when it appears that, you know, it's the place to be, it becomes the place to be. Yeah. And so that night... Michael Ritchie, who is now a humongous, you know, runs all the huge theaters in New York, was my stage manager. I remember him saying, it's time to go on. And I remember going, I don't want to go. <laughs> no. and he, he said to me, if, if you come, I'll make out with you. And yeah, I was like, okay, okay I'm coming. <laughs> <laughs> that's all it took. I get it. And I went on stage and I did my one woman show. And afterwards, Marsha waited with her manager and the casting director and do you remember uh, that night? The, like, do you remember the performance itself? Like, were you happy was, with how it turned out? Yeah, were you? It was. You had been working on it for so long. It was magical. Yeah, it was so magical when you have a packed house. Oh my gosh! You know, filled with people who want yeah. to love you up. Yeah. And I was the little engine that could. You know, this was the public theater in New York, the place that I walked by every day of my college life going someday I'm going to be there I know and I I played an understudy I played a spear carrier and then here I was you know headlining my own one woman show it was because you made it happen totally like because I made it happen Marsha Gay definitely gave you a foot up but sure but my show was going on with or without her but she you know she was just another angel I have a lot of angels in my life and that night after the show they waited for me Marsha introduced me to her manager, Peg. I'm like, hi, nice to meet you. You know, and she's like, great job. This is uh, this is my friend Randy. He's a casting director. And he's like, you're fantastic. Do you have any tape? I, I'm i casting a TV show. And right away, I'm like, oh, God, this is bullshit. This is the bullshit they say when they don't know what to really? say. Really? Were you a oh. part of you weren't like, oh, this is happening? No. no. He's like, I'm casting a TV show in Los Angeles. It's a, wor- a universal way for me. It just... Right. I've been so used to going in on auditions where people just bullshitted me. There's right. one... I don't know if you have this here. There's one casting director in New York, and she, you'll do an audition, and she doesn't know how to end it. She's awkward. She goes, she goes okay, so how tall are you? And what's your home number? Fantastic, thank you. She says it to everyone so every time, like, as if that you're going to get the something. role, right? <laughs> I need your weekend phone number, and I need to know how tall you are for costumes. Oh. But she does it because she doesn't just know how to go, hey, great work, thanks. Yeah. And she doesn't want to disappoint anyone. Well, that's and, sweet. And that's what this felt like. Like, yeah. you were t- terrific. Uh, I'm casting a brand new TV show in Los Angeles, and I think you'd be great for the role. Do you have any tape? Right. And, you know, right. you know I didn't have an agent, so... I said, I actually do have a tape, um, and the only reason why I have a tape, and this is also back to the magic of my life, is because when um, it was uh, New York Undercover and Law and & Order were doing episodes that included deaf people, 
And so they called the New York Society for the Deaf and said, do you have anyone who knows sign language who also can act? And so not through a regular agent, but through the sign language <laughs> agency, I got two jobs on, as, an, as lawyers on these TV shows because I could sign to the deaf clients. Wow. And so I said, I do have a tape. And I gave him my VHS copy because that's how we did it before. Sure. And he said, okay, great. I'm going to show this uh, to my boss. And you're like, I only have one copy. Don't yeah, lose it. I, like, I'm like, I have six <laughs> copies. They were $35 each. Yeah. <laughs> Please send it back. Yeah. You know what I mean? It's yeah. Like, yeah. And so, yeah. and you know, everyone, bye-bye. And I said hi to everybody else. And that was it. And about 10 days later, Marsha Gay's manager, Peg, called me. And she said, um, so Randy showed that tape to David Kelly who didn't think you were really right for the part. Um, Because what he was really wanting was somebody who was like streetwise and sassy and gum smacking. Right. And And that's not you. And that's not me, right? right? And so, and she said, but Randy was like, I don't know why you don't think that's what she is. I I just saw her one woman show and she's very much streetwise and sassy and gum smacking. And David Kelly's like, well, I saw her tape and she's got pearls on and suit on. And Randy's like, yeah, because she's playing a role and they put her in those pearls. Yeah. But you have to trust me. I saw her one on the show. She's like, she's a tough broad. Yeah. And he's like, all right, Randy, if she you really she's work on a so motorcycle, great. So. You know, yeah, he's like, she has a tattoo. She yeah. rides a motorcycle. She, you know, she's got the mouth of a truck driver. <laughs> and so David's like, if you think she's so great, bring her in. And so Peg, Marsha's manager, tells me this story. I'm like, well, that doesn't seem very promising. Yeah, keep that kind she of stuff goes, to well, yourself. He's willing to meet you. And I'm like, okay, great. When's he in town? She goes, no, you need to fly to L.A. to meet him. I'm like, you're telling me I have to fly to L.A. to meet a guy who doesn't even like me? And, she, and I go, okay, so they're paying for this, right? She's like, not, no. I'm like, Peg, I make... $360 a week at the public right. theater. I'm supposed to fly to LA and meet someone who hates me right. because why? And she goes, because these opportunities don't come up very often and Randy loves you. And I'm saying... So there must be something in your brain that's went, no, I got to do this. You know what was in my brain was if I'm never going to get a manager if I don't right. do what they tell me. Right. Like if I'm just like, well, I'm sorry. I don't want to, you know, <laughs> and I need a manager. So I thought, maybe she'll be my manager. She's calling me, you know. This, like, I, I literally just was like, I something's got to give. Yeah. So I I flew to L.A. Wow. to meet David Kelly. And it and I didn't know who he was. Yes. I didn't know he wrote Chicago Hope, Picket Fences, oh was God. soon to write Ally McBeal. It's probably I good know, that you didn't know I didn't know any of it. Yeah. I, only thing I knew is that he was married to Michelle Pfeiffer. <laughs> And I was like, well, he better be, you know, some hot shit. Or he's married to Michelle Pfeiffer. Right. So I walk in the room, and he's like a scrappy, you know, guy. And what I didn't really know is he's got an entirely dry sense of humor. But I didn't know that because I was petrified. And I sit down. Randy's there. David's there. And one other guy is there, and me. And David goes, so, uh, you're an actor? So mean. Yeah. It's like the worst thing to yeah. say. You're an actor? And I'm like, did you ever ask him about that moment oh, since then? Yeah. I, we've had it out. Yeah. And I was like, um, <laughs> yeah, that's why I flew across the continent and spent my life savings to meet you. Yeah. And I couldn't get a rise from him. There was nothing I could do. Right. It was a terrible, terrible four minute meeting that felt like an hour. Right. And that was it. It was four minutes. It was not good. And I got up to leave. And when I got up to leave, I noticed he had a cribbage board on the side of his couch. And, you know, the things that flash through your mind in that moment. And I'm like, um, I'm like, cribbage? He's married to Michelle Pfeiffer. When does he have time to play cribbage, you know? (laughs) And I just said, you play cribbage? Because it just seemed like a non sequitur to me that he would play cribbage. And it was the first time he showed any signs of life at all in our meeting. And he kind of sat up and fidgeted and he went, yeah, I do play cribbage, but I don't think you want to go there with me. Gauntlet thrown. I'm like, <laughs> I'm like, really? I go, because I feel like I could have this conversation with you and try to impress you like I'm obviously doing unsuccessfully right now. And I could beat the shit out of you at cribbage at the same time. <laughs> and he looked at me and now he's like, he likes me. Now he's like, uh, I don't think you understand. I play the computer. 
And I said, yeah, I don't think you understand. I play for money. Right. <laughs> and I go, listen, David, why don't we just screw this audition and I'll play you right now for the part. If I lose, you'll never see me again. No Chicago Hope, no Picket Fences, no Ally McBeal. And then I got the name of the show wrong. I go, no prosecutors. And, um, and, but, uh, but if I win, I walk out with the script. Right. And he's like, N- I don't think you understand. I skunked my mother last week, <laughs> which is a very big ordeal if he was telling the truth. And I said, no, no, I don't think you understand. I smell your fear. Right. And he was like up on his chair. You could see Randy going, what the fuck is going on? And I'm like, come on, David, what's, what's the problem? And he's like, I don't have time to play you in cribbage. And I go, I could have beat you in the time we have had this conversation about it. And he's like, he's like, all right, hold on, hold on. He goes, I can't make this deal with you. And I'll tell you why. I'm like, okay, what is it? And he goes, if I were to lose the game, I haven't written the script, so I wouldn't be able to give it to you. But I will make you this deal. I'm like, all right. And he said, if you leave my office right this minute, as soon as I write it, you'll be the first one to get it. <laughs> I was like, you got a deal. Right. And I walked out. And Randy like ran after me. He goes, what the hell just happened? I go, uh, your boss challenged me to a cribbage game. That's what happened. Yeah. He go fuck himself. <laughs> and like, <laughs> I just love this standoff over a cribbage. I, I know. It yeah. was it's so important to me that he thought he could beat me. Yeah. And so. But did the description come back differently? Yeah. Then, um, then I go home back to New York and I get. And what was your se- like, what's your sense at that point? Like, oh, oh well. I'm like, blew it. No, totally blew it. And TV's not for me. Right. Like, I, I'm, I don't belong in television. Right. You know, because I'm so scrappy. I This is really what was going through my mind the whole time. It's like, you are married to Michelle Pfeiffer. You don't play cribbage. I have been in 400 off-Broadway off shows. I usually have one line. I walk on stage and I say to the pretty girl, really? Then what happened? Right. And then I walk off stage and I play cribbage. Like, I know cribbage. So I was really... You were trained in cribbage because I was trained you were in cribbage. doing sphere carriers. That's right. Because yeah. nobody would cast me. <laughs> And so I come home, and maybe like four or five days later, Peg calls me, the manager. And she's like, what happened in L.A.? I'm like, well, I, don't, I don't know. And I told her the story. She's like, holy crap, Cameron. Um, they would like you to fly back out, and this time they're going to pay for it. I'm like, what? She goes, yeah, I'm sending you the script. She's sending me the script. Those were the days where when you got a script, you had to go to the agency right. and pick it up. Right. Right? They would this leave one. a box outside of the door yeah. and you'd like rifle through the box and yeah. pick it. She goes, we're going to messenger over a script. I'm like, what? What? Oh my God, messenger a script? This yeah. is crazy. And the script came and I turned to the page where they introduced the character and it didn't say, you know, like this street wise and sassy girl. Yeah. It said this Eleanor Frutt, this big, ballsy woman, walks into the room and takes over everything. With and a cribbage board in her back yes, pocket. Yes, right. <laughs> Not a gun, but a smoking cribbage board. <laughs> and I was like, holy shit. And, I, and she was like, yeah, holy shit. And I, they're sending me back? She goes, yeah. So, like, a, yeah. A two weeks later, I fly back to meet producers. And I... Yeah, I do, you know, David, and, and now I know that I can have a little bit of a chummy conversation with him, and I do. Then they fly me home. And now I'm on my way to the Aspen Comedy Festival because my one-woman show got invited to go there. Yeah, great. And I bring it to the Aspen Comedy Festival, and all these executives, you know, that's where they found, like, Ellen and Grace Under Fire, and all these great comedians were yeah. always going there. So all the TV executives were there. They're like, oh, you're Cameron. We've heard about you. It's like David Kelly was talking about me. Anyway, I do my show at the Aspen Comedy Festival. I go back to New York to live my normal life. And the manager calls me and she says, so they want you to test for network. I I don't have any idea what that means. For those of you who don't know what that means, it means you go back to L.A. You first negotiate your contract. Because they want you to want it so bad yeah. that you'll take crappy money. Yeah. So you negotiate your contract before the final audition. And when I say negotiate a contract, you negotiate it for a six-year period. Right. And because you don't have it, you're like, okay, I'll take that. And then they really get you over the barrel. Yeah, yeah. And then you go to New York, I mean to L.A., and you audition in front of every network executive. It's terrible. So terrifying. It's the worst yeah. situation in the world. Yeah. It's usually in a boardroom. It's terrible. 
And so she explains this to me, and I'm like, that sounds awful. She goes, it is awful, but that's what everybody does. And I go, I don't understand why I have to go back. I was just there. She goes, Cameron, this is the process. (laughs) And I'm like, it's ridiculous. I was just in Aspen. All of those people just saw me. Right. I go, can't you just tell them I'll take their stupid money? Because it it, it was more money than I ever heard of in my life. But to her, it was terrible. She's like, this is the worst deal I've ever (laughs) seen. You're like, take it. I go, listen, you know, it was a lot of money for me. Yeah. And, uh, but for TV standards, horrible. Because they lock you in for six years. you got to get, make some money. Yeah. So anyway, she goes, this money is terrible. I go, "Uh, the money's not terrible. And secondly, I don't want to go back there and lose it. Can't you just call them and say... She'll take your dumb oh money, God. but she's not coming back out for the network. And she goes, Cameron, it doesn't work like that. I go, why can't you? They're so They ballsy. just saw me. Yeah. All of those same network people just saw me. And she goes, okay, I'm going to suggest that. But you could hear in her voice going, you're an idiot. Yeah. You're going to lose this right. because nobody does it. It's the stupidest idea in the world. Right. It's your first TV thing. I don't know anything. Yeah. But it seemed really stupid that they're going to send me back out. After they've just seen me. Yeah. I've got stuff to do, you know. i got a big life. Yeah. You know? <laughs> and so I, I presented that as, why don't they just do that? And she's like, okay, Cameron. And she's not my manager. She's right. just still helping yeah. me because she's a friend of Marsha's. And I'm like, I just think you should ask. And she's like, okay, I'll ask. And, and you can hear, like, what an idiot you are. <laughs> and, I, and about six hours later, she's like, where are you? And I'm like, I'm in my apartment. She goes, okay, well, I've got good news and bad news. And I go, okay. And she goes, "Um, the good news is they've accepted your offer. And the bad news is they've accepted your offer. Right. And I'm like, what? She goes, they're casting you in it for that shit crap money that they, uh, for six years. Oh, my God. And I'm like, what? Are you kidding? Oh, and I remember sliding down my wall, just like crying. And my, my mother's the first person I called. I couldn't believe... I didn't even know what it meant. Yeah. I don't even know what it meant to be on a TV show. And I remember going back to Marsha and saying, Marsha, are they going to like talk in terms I don't understand? She's like, what do you mean? I go, am I going to get to set the first day and a director is going to be like, Cameron, go stand behind the F912. Right. And she <laughs> just, no, they don't talk. You're going to understand what they're saying. Yeah. And I'm like, I'm scared. And she goes, you don't have to be scared. And then mm. I went to a set with her to watch her work and what a gal it was amazing and then just to round it all out um the first when we shot the pilot we shot it in boston because the practice takes place in boston right and my very first scene in the entire uh movie and the first scene we shot was walking up to the courthouse steps me and dylan mcdermott and that's how we were introducing our characters, that we're always in a rush, and we are always got stuff going on, and we're walking up to, you know, work in a courtroom scene. And so we're walking, and about two minutes before he called action, the director came over with a coffee and a donut and said, I'd like you to carry these. And I, I'm literally flabbergasted. Mm-hmm. I, in my mind, I don't know this director. Mm-hmm. I don't know if I'm allowed to speak up. I don't know what I'm supposed to do. He, he wants me to introduce my character to the entire world, 22 million people watching, with a donut in my hand. Yeah. I was so upset, and I had no idea how I was going to handle this. You know, now, I would say, I'm sorry, I'm not carrying a donut. Yeah. But I didn't know no. what my rights were. I didn't want to get fired before it started. And I just, I, I said to Dylan, with which whom my only words up to that point were, hi, God, nice you're you. gorgeous. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that was your inner that voice. That was it. Yeah. Um, and I, um, I said, Dylan, don't you think I would be like your right-hand woman? I'd carry all your files mm-hmm. and your coffee and your donuts and your everything. And he's like, yeah, I love that. I go, because I just feel like I'm just going to be on top of you the whole series yeah. doing everything for you. And he's like, let's do it. And so if you ever watch the pilot of the practice, that opening scene of me and Dylan walking up to the courthouse steps, you will see me shoving a donut into his mouth as we rush hurriedly up to the courthouse steps. I love that. And that to me was one of the biggest victories I ever had before I knew what my true power really was. Right. God, that's so great, though. It's like finding out how we hit these roadblocks and how to get past them, you know, and how to make them work for you. Like, it all, 
it does feel like whenever you've hit a roadblock, you go in the same way when you see a bad play. Yeah. How am I going to make this work for me? Yeah. And now in your life now, like, how are you, like, what's your, what's your dreams now? Cause you've done these shows that are huge. And, um, I do love that every time you, you do any kind of acceptance speech, you thank your crews. Yeah. Cause I know your crews are huge for you. They're my people. Do you feel like that's like what you just want to do is just hang out with a crew now? I have gone to Europe with the crew. I know every baby that was born on the crew. Yeah. I, I'm one of those actors, and this is a shout out to all you actors out there. It's really important that we take care of our crew. Get food trucks, give them wrap gifts, get, write yeah. them notes, take it's pictures. Huge. Do It's really important because without them, we're just, you know, talking to nobody. And I, they have become my family. I love, I mean, I just did a reading for my costume designer on major crimes. Right. I, we put together a gorgeous reading in my house because he wrote a script. And, you know. So one of the things with our, our podcast, because I, I, you know, I started this podcast because I wanted to celebrate firecracker women in a way that wasn't just talking about their resumes. Right. Like finding out about those kind of challenges because you know there's a hundred women that are going to listen to this going, that's me. And how did she get through it? And you did it by putting on your boxing gloves. Well, I started a mentoring program at NYU. Yeah. So for years, I didn't go back there. I really did no, not like them. that must have been hard to go back at all, though. It was terrible, but... Do you remember when you first went back again after that time? Years later, um, after I wrote my one-woman show, and I really, I really held NYU up to the spotlight for what they did to me in terms of my weight. Yeah. And I really did hold a huge, you know... Uh, anger and rage towards them for sure. doing that to me. Yeah. Um, they started having internal discussions about stopping to tell the girls to lose weight. Good. And um, one of the teachers was more friendly with me than any, Debbie Lapidus, who teaches at Juilliard and NYU. We've since become very close friends. And she, you know, said, you know, I just want you to know, you made a change. Like, we don't do that anymore. Yeah. You know, maybe if they want to do it or if it's a health situation, but we don't require people to lose weight anymore and you should know that that's because of you and because you're one woman show that you held the light up to them and because of that she asked me to come and speak to one or it to, she organized a rendezvous between me and one of her students mm -hmm. who was struggling and I had a really great long talk with her and it seemed to have really made a big difference and so she went back and told her classmates and the classmates asked if I could come and talk to them so year after year I would go back and talk and I would pass some of those teachers in the hall. But, you know, I was still, you know, in pursuit of an acting career. And I yeah. was a sign language interpreter. And um, because it was great for the students to hear from me, they started to hear from other alumni, too. Yeah. And then I made a suggestion that they should start a mentoring program where every student who came out of NYU was attached to a mentor who was a working actor who could help them, you know, just shepherd them through that horrible process I went through. Yeah. So that program started, and then I suggested that they had a series of alumni talkbacks. So I helped them curate that. And then I started to really be a more active speaker. My whole point in when I talk to the students, I don't talk about acting, and I don't really talk about agents and managers. All of that comes in time. Yeah. And I'm not really worried about them when they're acting. I'm worried no. about them when they're not acting. Yeah. Because when you're an acting student, all you want to do is act. That's when you're happy. But if it's the only thing that makes you happy to act, you're not going to be happy most of the time. And if I could spare someone the true soulful, profound sadness that I went through for a good five years. Yeah. And I could spare them that by giving them permission to grieve that it's not going as they thought it was and not to ask so much of themselves oh gosh, so that they yeah. fail at their own hand and talk to them about what really they should expect from the first five, ten years of getting out of school. Maybe I can make a difference. And that has been uh, where I have where I really feel I thrive, I'm the best teacher at trying to save the soul of the gypsy that's in us because yeah. that's what got harmed in me. And that's, I came back, you know, as a boxer to beat the crap out of yeah. people. But not everybody is born with that, you know? No. But everybody, I mean, you, you are making so many contributions in so many different ways through the charity stuff that you do, through just your presence and the roles that you're doing. Thank you. Uh, what, do you, what do you hope is your legacy? 
Wow. Um, you know, game nights. I guess yeah. that's going to be up there on the list. You know, I. I really don't have. It's really interesting. I these incredible things have happened to me, but my dreams aren't crazy and lofty. I don't need to write, you know, the manifesto. Of, I really, I want to. I had a fiftieth birthday recently, and I had two hundred and fifty people come, and they did a roast, and it was the most beautiful thing in the whole world because I knew they could trust me, trust my humor. And that they love me so deeply that they could just attack me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know, yeah. call me so bossy. Right. And it was beautiful. And honestly, you know, you think because I've accomplished what I have, that I have these huge lofty goals. I want to be a great parent. I want to raise a boy who is a good citizen. I want him to love me and want to share his life with me and not separate, you know, from me. I want to be a great friend. I want to I want to be a critical thinker and I want to be generous to the planet. I, you know, I don't know. I just I I don't believe in happiness as like a never-ending thing. I I think there's too much suffering in the world to want to just be happy. Mm -hmm. I like to string you know, I think it's a really, it's a myth. Well, I just want to be happy. It How is sort of an be overall. happy yeah. when so many people are suffering? What I would like... It's relative to the person, too. Like, yeah. happiness is this moment here. Yeah. And That's why, you well, know. it's little joys. I'd like to string as many little joys as closely together as possible. That's That is good. really my, my dream. I love... <sighs> I love doing my art when it's exciting and I'm with like-minded people. I like being with like-minded people who think does have the same political values. I love a good argument. Mm -hmm. I love a great game. Um, I love a raucous game of running charades and pushing people out of the way. It's very love important it. that I win. I have been disinvited <laughs> to some game nights because I can I hurt people. Uh, but I don't mean to. I'm like a gentle giant. Sure. Okay. Um, Noted. I <laughs> Truly, I know it's a really weird thing to say, but I've accomplished more than I ever dreamed was possible. And sometimes I feel selfish to dream even bigger, but I do. I, you know, I want to write and... Yeah, do you have any more writing projects under your... Or really, directing? Does that ever in interest you? Producing is more interesting. You yeah. know, I'm not... Directors are special creatures. They have a vision before it happens. Yeah. I never have the vision in advance. I the vision reveals itself to me as we go. You should go. be improvising. I love improvising. Yeah. Rebecca North invited me to her improvising class tonight. Are you gonna go? Let's <laughs> go. Go. Yeah, I might. I'm gonna go. You're gonna go. Shut You're up. not scared. Going. Get your boxing gloves. Um, I'm just gonna live my life. I'm gonna have, a, you know, I want to travel and I want to keep acting and being part of my community and, you know, fighting for what I believe in and I don't know. I. I'll do a little writing, but I, I, I love, I love my life. I love having spent this time in Toronto. I love watching my son fly so high. I, uh, my, my mom is 92 years old. Oh She's gosh. remarkable and listens to NPR every morning and we fight about politics. It's yeah. fantastic. It does I, feel though, looking at you and, and just knowing you a little bit, it feels like you really value and celebrate your life daily. Like, and I don't, and I see you genuinely doing it as opposed to like, hashtag blessed. You know what I mean? Exactly. Like, I do see you really I will say, um, 2016 was a really hard year for me. I had breast cancer, which I'm fine now. Oh I beat the crap out of. Of course you did. yourself <laughs> breast cancer. <laughs> right. And, uh, uh, Trump was elected. It was a terrible, terrible year for yeah. me. I really couldn't even get out of bed. And, um, I remember the new year rolled around and I couldn't even like say happy new year with, yeah. with truth. And I was like, how am I going to do this? Like, how am I going to live in this life I love? And I'm so upset and flipped out. And I honestly, it finally occurred to me, like, I live, I am so grateful and I am so outraged. And they live simultaneously in me. And I do live a very grateful life because it's a beautiful, a beautiful life. But yeah. I am outraged at the, at our administration and the world and the refugees, and the... I'm just, but you seem to put it in a place where it doesn't distinguish your joy. No, because then it's meaningless, you know? It's like if you, all you do is, um... If all you do is live in sorrow for someone you've lost, then you aren't 
celebrating what it is they lost to begin with. You know, it becomes like, well, if life is so sad, why were you hoping they'd be there joining you? It's like, you know, it's like you have to celebrate it yeah. to make the loss matter. You know, I, I, I know it's a really weird esoteric idea, but I see all the suffering I do my part and I could do more and I and I think that's probably my biggest goal is to do more without getting so mired in it that right. I can't feel the joy. Yeah. Um but I am joyful every day. It's a beautiful life I got to lead. It's a pleasure to spend any moments with you. We it had really so is. much fun. But I've we so... didn't even say how we met or well, what's going on. The intro. It's another story. I just so love spending time with you and every time we've spent time I'm like I'm charged to do something or to connect with somebody. You're such a connector and you're such a vibrant like in your outrage it's vibrant which is probably the best way to be outraged. I've decided I might want to become a friends concierge. You're good at that. Like, you tell me you're going to a city, and I'll just set you up with a bunch of awesome people. I like that. <laughs> I think that, that's how you got here. Tony Napple, right? That's right. He He's like the Tony. mayor of Toronto <laughs> theaters. Yes. He is. And he gave me a key. He and is. And it's been really fantastic. Well, thank, thank you, you for spending time with me, and thank you for sharing your thoughts. And um, I can't wait to the next time we get to spend time together. Well, it's going to be soon. New York, Los Angeles, who knows? We are very, you know, We're metropolitan girls. We're... Hi. I, I, does everybody know that your dog and is And the here? dogs. Well, I, they can hear him click clacking. They can hear him whining. Oh, I he's know. really, I think he's, a, he's upset that there were no questions directed at him. Ah, Rufus. Do you want some water? There we yeah. go. There's water. You're There's there. a question. Okay. Anyway, thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank Thanks you. Thanks for welcoming oh me. Oh my gosh. Oh my god. Anytime. You if I ever have a home, you're welcome to it. Thank you. Well, okay. Yeah. You know me. If it's a if it's a couch, you're welcome to sleep on it. <laughs> if it's a home, you're welcome inside it. The question is is will you sleep on the couch? <laughs> yes, I will. For you, I won't do it for everybody, but for you and I'm the kind of person who would ask, like, that couch is a little small. <laughs> How does it feel if you let me sleep in your bed? <laughs> but a, I would do the same. A dear friend, for sure. <laughs> You're fantastic. I just feel like I should say you're welcome after that interview. Because aren't you just buzzed? Aren't you jazzed? Aren't you just like, rawr, I'm going to do something today. I'm going to go see a play. I'm going to call up somebody I barely know and go and see a play. I love it. I love her. Uh, follow her because she's doing amazing, amazing work. She's everything she does. She does with such passion, such heart. And she's, you know, speaking of what I said in my intro, she's a huge advocate for crews and the value of connecting with everybody. It's it's so important. You know, we don't do these shows by ourselves. I mean, this show. I don't do this by myself. I record the intro, the outro, the the interview, and then I send them to Sebastian over at Grace and Matthews, and then Caitlin Curcio and Tyler Levine over at Carousel. They help put it together. It's a team. We're, we're not alone in these things, and we have to recognize that we've got amazing support around us. So thank you. Thank you, everybody who's been um, supporting Firecracker Department so far. Uh, shout outs to Jen and uh, Naomi and uh, not me, other Naomi, um, Claire and Paul and uh, Michael. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you, thank you for all your support. If you feel uh, inspired, go write a review on iTunes because it really helps us build our audience and uh, we're not going to stop. So let's just build this until it bursts. Thank you so much for listening today. Uh, go on and follow us at Firecracker Department, DPT, and uh, check out the past uh, interviews as well, because there's some good ones, and there's some great ones coming up too. We have, um, hopefully all the cast from Mr. D are going to have a chat at some point, so stay tuned for that. Thanks so much for listening, everybody. Really appreciate it, and we'll speak to you next time. I'm Naomi Sneakus. Bye!